Okay, so now we're going to talk about something very special and dear to Unbound and InnoFest collaboration, which is literally why we are all here, to meet each other, to understand what we do, and understand how we can help each other. And this next panel talks about how big brands and corporations are reaching out to smaller or medium-sized agencies and branding and marketing uh, offices that are helping them understand their customers. Uh, so please give me uh, your attention and a huge round of applause for the moderator for this panel, Ms. Leisha Chi from BBC News. I'm going to get them to introduce themselves first, but I'm going to start right at the end with Keith, who um, I noticed from stalking him online has quite an interesting background. He's done volunteer work in East Timor and also was part of some fight club while in school. Um, so well, take it away. I don't think we should talk about that. Um, <laughs> hello, everybody. I'm Keith um, from an agency called VML. We've been through the journey of being an independent agency and then we crossed over and joined the dark side of WPP. Looking forward to talking about that. Jim Go from Brick. Yeah, hi, I'm Jim Go. I work for Brick. I'm on the other side. I came from the dark side to the bright side. Right. And Casper, uh, who was a former investment banker before making the jump to a different industry. I was about to say, if anyone went from the dark side to the bright side, I, I think that was me. <laughs> um, so I used to work in banking, but I've been at WPP for 12 years now. Um, currently CEO of Wonderman um, here in Asia Pacific. Uh, so my fourth role within, within the WPP. Great, well thanks for that. So obviously the theme of our conversation today is David versus Goliath, the rise of the boutique. So naturally, my first question is going to be about size and whether it really matters when it comes to the industry. Is bigger better or, sh or is it more fun at a smaller boutique agency where you've got more fun and flexibility? Let's start with Jim, who is at a boutique agency. Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, size doesn't matter when you're looking at a uh, big size clients because they need network coverage. Um, they need the level of support and resources compared to some other small size or medium size uh, clients where size doesn't really matter. But what matters are basically the attention, um, the understanding and probably the commitment um, that one can give uh, to the business. So in that aspect, yes, size does matter. The thing though is that you came from a big agency, you used to be part of Omnicom and you set up your own shop. What led to that job? Sorry? Why did you move uh, from a big agency to start up your own shop? Well, I, I guess, you know, uh, comes a point in life, you say midlife crisis. <laughs> um, I, I've been working uh, for multinationals and running uh, big networks for many years and I guess there comes a point to say, you know, what do I want uh, for myself and what do I see in the industry going for? Um, that's where I start to see um, when I first joined um, the advertising world from the client side, um, there was a, a total uh, disintegration. So it went from full service to splitting up every piece of the business. And now I think uh, it's coming together but in a different form, still part of the integration. So we are, I think we are, we are going back in time. And why, why I'm uh, I mean, jump the ship is because I see uh, certain opportunities where as a big ship, like a super tanker, it probably take a long time to make a U-turn. Speedboat makes uh, the turnaround a lot faster. I see. Well, Keith, uh, you sold uh, your firm, a boutique agency, to WPP. WPP. Right, sir. Yes. So, um, what, what's your view on this subject? But when, when you're independent, you have that rebel alliance feeling. So that, that's, that's always nice to, to really kind of go off in that, in that David scenario. Um, so I think there was a great deal of passion. There was also uh, a great deal of uh, uncertainty because you're, you're constantly dealing with where does, the, where does the next paycheck come. And as you go through that, that growth process, 
it gets harder and harder because that's when you start to find a lot of the significant contracts have been locked up by, by the larger groups. Um, and so I think generally there's two motivations to, to sell. If one of them is to be able to be part of that larger structure in order to, to take part in some um, client relationships that you frankly be very unlikely uh, to be able to otherwise. And when you do that, you have C-level access to Fortune 500 companies. And there, there is a tremendous amount of um, impact you can see happening there. Well, Casper, tell us about your experience. You had Wonderman, yeah. um, where you oversee creative, a uh, lot of creative operations, but also, which is very data-driven too. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can give it a slightly different perspective, having not sold or bought a company into WFPP. Um, I think there's an element here also of specialization, um, which also comes with scale, or the ability to specialize that comes with scale. That may seem like a, a sort of a counterintuitive thing to say, but the, the, the industry is becoming increasingly complex. You know, we've been to a number of conversations today about ad tech and martech, and just the, the massive number of opportunities to engage in the complexity of our industry. And the reality is that agencies these days to service their clients properly um, need, to, need to be able to take specialists in the room with them. You know, it's no longer okay to show up for group of generalists. Um, and so one thing, I think one of the benefits that comes from being within a big and larger agency group is that you're able to build those specialist teams more easily. Um, now, and I'm interested in your view on this as well, because I think the smaller agencies, of course, often go with a very specialized capability or something, which comes back to, again, how they collaborate with other people in the ecosystem. You know, as you were saying, you can't be all things to all men if you're, a, if you're a small agency in this world today. Um, but you know, a lot of our clients expect from us to be able to advise them on technology, on data, on creative, on lots of things which require us to be able to have specialists in business. But your business is in kind of a sweet spot because we have the two giants, Omnicom and WPP, basically transforming their business and uh, shifting towards using analytics, big data, in order to drive future business and growth. Yeah, I mean, the way that I think about um, uh, the, the area that we operate in is that more and more clients are using the technology to find new ways to engage with consumers. Um, that may be automation, it may not be automation, but certainly they're using and trying to find or using technology to, to engage with consumers. And if you're using a technology to engage with consumers, your agency needs to, first of all, understand that technology. Secondly, they need to understand how that technology makes its decisions. And usually for a technology, if it's making decisions about how to engage, it's doing that based on data. So it also means you need to understand the data strategy and the consumer journeys and various things. And all of that means that you need a very different kind of creative agency. You know, an agency that understands those three things is a very different kind of creative agency. So you know, that is where we focus, is the intersection of those three things. Um, well, well, moving uh, off that thought, Keith, I'd like to throw this to you. Uh, you have spoken quite a bit about how the digital disruption is affecting your industry and how if you went to business school and studied marketing and you learned about the four P's which I didn't go to business school so I have to look at my notes price, place, promotion and product you should throw that out the window because of this digital disruption do you still believe that? Um, I, I, I didn't propose throwing it out the window I propose that you need to supplement it with, with the new four P's around things like participation in in a world where you no, no longer necessarily define your brand in, in a pure marketing sense. The brand is typically defined by the experiences that people have and what they then say about it. So everyone has the power to, to express that. And so you just have to look at things that have happened, for example, to United Airlines recently, or the, the Fire Festival fiasco, um, three Fs, um, to, to, to get a sense of the power of that kind of uh, medium. To, to me, what's really interesting in, in, in the space we're all going into, and no agency can not have a technology and data strategy. It does not exist. And I think there was a session earlier on here about, you know, from, from mad men to math men. And this is something we're all experiencing. But to me, there's a really interesting collision that started and that's going to, I think, grow in ferocity. And if you look at the, the start of this event yesterday, you had Accenture speak, and then you had our colleague Matt from, from YNR, a traditional agency, speak straight after him. And that's what we're seeing now, a collision between 
the consulting companies who are coming from a technology data perspective first and foremost, and they're looking to layer on creative services. And groups who've come from a creative background are supplementing with technology services. I think the consultancies have done actually a really good job of positioning themselves to do that. And ironically, we as an industry have done a bad job of, of expressing what I think Casper was, was alluding to. It's about the customer experience. First and foremost, the differentiation comes with the customer experience. The technology has to follow that. The cart has to follow the ball. So we actually have a really important role. I, I, I'm just not sure we're expressing that uh, well enough at the moment. I want to get to the customer experience in just a second, but basically you mentioned the consultancies, once like PwC, PwC is one uh, such example where they're now going head to head with the agencies. So Jim, what's your thought? Do you think we're going to see even more um, cannibalism, for lack of a better word, in the industry? We already see the big giants of Omnicom and WPP buying up a lot of the boutiques. Um, if you divide the uh, customers into different views, um, there are clients that spend lots of money that they can afford data. There are still some clients that want data but can't afford. So where do you live then? And in terms of customer experience, as far as they're concerned is, can I move that product off the shelf? Okay, you're talking about the small, medium-sized uh, companies um, where you, know, you don't have an army of marketing people like whether it's in Unilever or in PNG, you have a handful of people that does everything. So um, when it comes to um, whether it's Omnicom or whether it's WPP buying up uh, data companies, they are catering to a specific segment of the market. Now, there are still a lot of uh, uh, part of the, the client portfolio uh, pyramid where there are gaps, where it can't be filled with the data. So what do you do? So these are the areas where some people call it boutique agencies, some people call it specialized agencies, but those are the areas where we thrive. And hence, the collaboration uh, sometimes with uh, networks that has such resources will help uh, clients. Okay, so if it's about the customer experience and now most people are looking for authenticity and you have to do that content creation and a lot of it is being driven by these algorithms and big data. Casper, I mean, how would you go about uh, creating something when we've seen uh, these big data driven type campaigns sometimes really fall flat? For example, in the beer market, um, uh, that's it was so similar, we saw the rise of craft beer because people wanted something different, something more individual, more authentic. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 you know, there's, there's an interesting debate around the extent to which AI and machines can and should create the content. You know, certainly, you know, there is a role for machine-built creative, especially at the, at the very edgy performance end of the campaign, you know, where it's really about multiple versions of colors and backgrounds and, all that sort of stuff. But I'm not, I'm not someone who would ever suggest for a moment that, um, that, that, that machines and technology will take away the role of creators of content or the importance of content. I think content is absolutely essential. And Vice just had a fascinating session. You know, that a lot of what I've been doing here at this conference has been about content. So it's really, it, it, what it is is about making sure that the best and most relevant content finds its way to the audience that is going to appreciate it the most, or find it the most interesting, or find it the most relevant, or be the most engaged by it, right? And, and I think technology does have a role to play there, but I, I, I wouldn't suggest that the, the, the technology necessarily has a role in just, you know, it can certainly help create content, there's no question about that. I mean, we've seen lots of great examples. An example I often think about is the 3M campaign for post um, you know, it was the one in Cannes a couple of years ago, and it was beautiful because the idea was that you bored of those shoes following you around the internet. You know, click on our banner and write yourself a post-it note. You know, write yourself a reminder, and we will make sure your reminder follows you around the internet. So it's taken one of the most annoying things about the internet and turned it into an incredibly positive user experience. You know, user-generated content with very simple use of technology simply because whoever came up with the content idea understood what the technology was capable of. So, you know, I think, I, I think the two can coexist very happily. They have to coexist very happily. 
OK, let's stick with this, because you've got the creative idea, but then there are also those who execute it, and it falls completely flat. So let's talk about one of the biggest advertising fail, advertising branding fails this year, also known as Pepsi. Um, we saw Pepsi's in-house team create that, and they obviously tried to tap into the whole Instagram influencer, Kendall Jenner uh, type of crowd. What was your take on how they could have done things better, and whether they should have outsourced that instead? Use an agency. We're <laughs> <laughs> a bit biased in that regard. I mean, I think you know, it comes back to the point of the human insight. And if you, if you take a very superficial view of a human insight, you're going to end up with a very superficial output. There was actually a great piece I just saw. I think it was Heineken. It was a similar idea, but it was getting people with diametrically opposed views, didn't know what those views are, to kind of do some things together, so get to know each other's people. Then they were told there was the transgender hater and the transgender person, and then they had the option to have the beer together or not. So it was thinking about the same kind of topics that are, that are relevant today, but explored it in a way that was, I guess, mean, like had, had some meaning behind the activity. When you look at the Pepsi thing, that was basically an ad that was trying to, um, that felt like a very glossy take, a very Pepsi ad take on uh, an important topic. Honestly, I don't think it has to be agency or I don't think an internal team couldn't do that. But I, to me, it was more about the, the, the focus of, of, of what happened there. It was, it was completely wrong. So you, you're saying that we shouldn't stay away from such hot topics when it comes to putting out these type of campaigns. It's just making it sure you do it in a smart way. Some, some of the best campaigns are exactly because they're on hot topics. But if you take a superficial view, then you're better off uh, staying at home on that one. So, um, Jim, in terms of the uh, landscape today, where so much of this stuff is online, where you have to compete uh, with Google, Amazon, and Facebook, who are essentially uh, changing how everything is done, is there a new strategy in terms of engaging this digital audience? That's a tough question. <clears throat> Google, Facebook, all the media giants, so to speak, um, have their hands into everything. Um, one of the things that, I mean, when, when you talk about data, you talk about uh, uh, a massive uh, way that they manipulate or they use the data, um, obviously, it's to a lot of the advantage. Now, um, how we work with them at this point, I mean, we've got to work from hand to mouth for now. Um, for now till the time when they really dominate, they will dominate, um, we have to ensure that uh, what we have, I think I heard uh, uh, one presentation today that uh, customer experience going direct to customers, um, we have the ownership of being able to manage the client, the customers, is just where we are going to manage, help them manage on behalf of their client, their customers as well. Um, Google, Facebook, or whatever not that comes in in the next uh, few years with Instagram, uh, they are going to be there. Uh, we are going to be around as well, but it's how we evolve uh, to be able to understand whether it's the, the, the uh, human insights, or we are even faced right now, uh, uh, not even the, the, the battle between called uh, David versus Goliath, but in-house agency of corporations. They're bringing it in-house. They're doing things themselves. So Facebook, Instagram, all, all those are, will be for now facilitations. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it comes back to the sort of topic. And I, you know, it's, it's really about collaboration. I mean, whether it's David and Goliath, I mean, we're, we're a David compared to Google. Um, yeah, certainly, we're WPP, certainly if you look at you know, market cap and things like that. So, I mean, you know, it, it's, it, everyone, every David has their Goliath. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, we see we have, you know, we have lots of different points of view in our organization, Google and Facebook and organizations like that. But without a question, we coexist. And we have to find ways to collaborate because they are a crucially important consumer touch point and, and, and a point of engagement with people that our brands are trying to talk to. Um, but again, you know, they are technology platforms, certainly they have data. 
But again, you know, the content, the way that the way that that engagement actually happens, does require often sort of you know, a human touch to it as well. You know, even in the world of voice search, you know, that's the next thing that's coming along now, where people aren't even searching for brands anymore; they're just searching for, for products in a way they never did on Google before. You know, you no longer have a list of products to choose from; you just get one answer. It changes everything. Keith, what do you think? You um uh, said in a previous presentation that you think that basically, in terms of size, like their own countries, how you compete with that or collaborate with that. Uh, I heard a, um, an indicative but somewhat alarming stat yesterday, which is that Google and Facebook are now 30% of media dollars in the world. And they're not even in China. I don't know if they're in China or that. Would be. At least China is protectionist and has given them some competition. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. There you go, we'll all move to China. So, um, if, if what happens is brands just go direct to Facebook and just don't go direct to Google, then what accountability is there in, in, in that value chain? And if you think, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have seen what's happened with, with YouTube recently, um, the YouTube ban, which sadly has not affected Google's earnings. So I'm not sure how much it might, but I'm, I'm, I know there's a lot of great people at Google looking at that and saying, what is, a, what is a better way of doing this? And I think from, a, from an advertiser point of view, look at it and say, there is a huge margin being made on this platform. And I don't think you can go on forever saying, we're not responsible for this content. We're not responsible that has been generated by someone else. You can't be a media platform, ultimately, and you are a media platform, in my view at least, and, and not have responsibility for, for the content. So. I believe there's a really important role for an, an industry, um, very active with the IAB because of that fact. That we as an industry have to take responsibility for the content, for, for privacy, for the quality of what we're providing to the, to the end consumer. And therefore, I think it's really important, as, as, as Casper said, you know, we, are, we are collectively tiny compared to the might of these machines, but we at least can aggregate and hold um, hold these partners to account in certain areas and work with them um, constructively in, in other areas. I think it's, you know, it is, as the theme of, of, of the convergent stage, it's collaboration. Um, I like the idea of collaboration, but last week we had Google earnings and as Keith touched upon, uh, based on the statistics, we see that Google gets nearly 90% of all advertising revenue uh, from online search. It essentially is a monopoly. If you go by classic economic terms, it's a monopoly. And, you're compete and Facebook and Amazon are in similar positions. They're essentially monopolies in such, in such respective fields. Should they be broken up? They're too big. They're big goliaths. You should take a stand and throw it at them. Should they be broken up? Jim, do you have a point of view on that? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. You're the banker, customer. <laughs> one in five or whatever the statistic is, you know, another way of looking at that is, it's only one in five. You know, it's actually interesting. I mean, if you think about the ubiquity of Google, you just mentioned the statistic in terms of search. You know, if you think of the ubiquity in terms of Facebook outside China, some very limited markets as the social network now, um, if you look at, you know, then I'm actually surprised it's only 20% of one in five. You know, it means that four in five are still going to other media. And I think that's one of the reasons why you can't, as an advertiser, just focus on, so on Google and just focus on, on Facebook. But you still need agencies because, you know, ultimately we see across everything that we should see across everything, whether it's for accountability or even more importantly, whether it's because someone needs to understand the full customer journey and be able to engage along with all points of that customer journey in a way which is consistent, coherent, relevant, engaging, or whatever you, whatever word you want to apply. And if you only do that within Google, and within Facebook, and then within, within whatever media and whatever media and it's very difficult to connect it all up. It's difficult enough to connect it up even if you do. So, you know, this, this idea of silos is counterproductive to the ultimate objective of many, of many advertisers ultimately. Okay, well, if we look at other strategies that I mentioned earlier, of Omnicom and WPP, uh, there have been reports that they're looking to take a walled garden approach. Um, in order to counter this uh, uh, threat from Google and the Facebooks and so forth. So you're saying that the walled garden approach necessarily isn't the best? Well, I mean, I, you know, 
Certainly our role is not to create more government. Our role is to sit across the top of all the different media channels, media opportunities, and you know, make sure that we're providing advice to our clients on a consistent creative idea that is executable in a consistent way across the customer journey across all the things. It's not to create our own silo. Well, sticking with the agencies, I mean, a lot of them, aside from buying the boutiques, they do media buying, they uh, buy up firms that work in advertising technology and data, and some would argue that the Omnicoms and WPPs are basically the content they create could compromise objectivity, that there could be a conflict of interest there. Any thoughts? Jim. Sure. <laughs> no, I don't want to say that in the <laughs> Well, when, when you look at these two giants, um, the way that they have perceived data um, and the way that the world is moving, whether it's Amazon or whether it's Facebook, uh, there's a lot of catch up data. But the thing is that they do have a lot of high cash. Of uh, data, and with uh, Omnicom and, and WPV going after data, is basically to be able to match up and do the work that you do uh, and you do uh, on behalf of the clients. Now, the fact that they are still not in China tells you that there's still a lot of interesting things that is going to happen, but for foreseeable future that's not going to happen. In fact, that's going to be the other way around. OK, well, we, are, um, about, we have about 10 minutes to go. So I just want to say that we would love to take questions to um, the panel. So if anyone wants to just throw their hand up at any time and uh, ask something, please do. Just while we're, while we're waiting on that, maybe I can just also and I'm going to make Keith answer the question as well, by the way, because <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, is there a conflict of interest? Um, you know, I, I, I believe the answer categorically is no. You know, our clients expect us to deliver the most effective, most efficiently executed campaigns and marketing for them, and advertising for them. You know, that's what they expect from us. And um, th there is no reason why we should not invest in technology and data assets to make sure that we're able to do that. No reason at all. Now, within, within WPP, we have a number of ways of making, of making that technology and that, that data accessible. In fact, I wouldn't say not any reason not to do it. I think it would be criminal as not to do it. You know, and I think our clients would have a right to call us on it if we were literally saying, oh, look, you know what, we're just, we're just going to be, we don't have a point of view, right? So I think well, I'm proud of the fact that we work for an organization that does have a point of view. Um, and we make that, that data and that technology accessible to our clients in lots of different ways. Um, Based on their needs, you know, we have lots of different clients, like you said as well. You know, we have clients that are huge global international advertisers, and we have clients who work in single markets, and their needs are fundamentally different. You know, their 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 own ability to run these systems themselves is fundamentally different. As a result, their own ability or desire to make these technology choices for themselves or acquire the data for themselves is fundamentally different. So, the extent to which they are they want to and are able to rely on their agency to help them as a result is fundamentally different. And so if we had no point of view, we would literally only be servicing a very small part of the market. Right? So it's about how we bring it to them. We bring it to them in lots of different ways, but by not having it, we get all sorts of trouble. Yeah, I think the, the, there's potential for conflict of interest in pretty much any business. Uh, you can just think of the dynamic between a sales force and the creation of a product. There is potential for or negligence or you know, flat out wrongdoing in any organization. So I believe we, we all should be held to account. That's why I think industry bodies are vital um, and sort of collaborating with regulatory structures are, are vital. Um, but fundamentally, as, as Casper was saying, anyone who's in a, a people business where you're working to provide services to organizations, fundamentally to the human beings in those organizations, the only way you will prosper long term is, you know, David or Goliath is by providing good advice to the best of your ability, to the best interest of, of the client. If, you, if, you're, if you're able to do that, then good things will happen. 
right? If you're, if you're trying to pull a fast one, you generally don't last that long in, in, in this industry. Speaking about the best interest of the client, another epic failure we saw was with United Airlines. Um, basically, when they kicked uh, this passenger off the plane, it caused a huge firestorm. And now almost every airline is under scrutiny um, over how they treat their passengers. So, in terms, do you think that companies like United Airlines are behind the curve in terms of the digital disruption and not realizing that every person is now a citizen journalist or someone who can post anything to social media and damage their brand? Are they behind the times? Why are they behind the times? They're huge. They should have proper advice given to them. Sometimes when you're big, you become arrogant. And basically in that context, uh, they think that they can get away with things without realizing that the people on the ground, people have cameras, and those are connected. And I guess the aftermath of it is what they have faced uh, with a huge loss, you know, potentially, but I guess they set it out of court. Okay, so let's see any hands for questions, so we're going to continue the conversation. Going once, going twice, okay. Well, let's go back to the whole um, change in the digital landscape and the creation of consumer-driven content and how they now have the power. Tell us how you guys are adapting it in your firms. I think it's a great question. I think it's, it's the question that uh, everyone should be asking themselves, you know, even if they're not a minimum. You know, on the United Airlines piece, as far as I understand it, and I mean, by the way, I have to say, I think for any of us living in Singapore, this is the best country to live in the world when you talk about um, getting around. Flying on an airline in the US is a horrible experience. Um, and I think this has unearthed something deeper, which is they actually have regulatory protection that allows them to throw people off the plane. I mean, I don't, has anyone been thrown off a Singapore Airlines flight? Like, I, I don't think that happens here, does it? Like, I've never, I've never seen that happen. I don't think, by practice, I don't think uh, airlines in Asia tend to overbook, whereas that is a, an accepted norm. I think what's changing now is people are starting to say, why should we accept this? To me, it's horrendous that a customer can pay, be seated on the plane to get that service and be thrown off for an employee of, of the airline, for an employee. So I think there's fundamental structural issues with the airline industry in, in the US. Um, and social media can have an incredible power to start to change, at, at its best, on our finest day, because it's not always fine, but on our finest day on social media, we have incredible power to change things for, for the better. And I think this is a, it's sort of, to the Pepsi point, you need to understand what that means. Like, what is, what is it that people are moved by? Injustice is something that moves people deeply, and you can't, there, there was this um, trend sort of happened a few years ago, and it was called something like uh, culture jacking. You know, this idea that you'd see something that people were talking about, and you'd jump on as a brand, you know. And, and when you do that badly, it's horrendous, it really is. You end up damaging your, your brand. And I think it's really important to, to be clear what your brand stands for, and who it stands with in that, and who it doesn't stand with, who maybe it's completely against. And I think the, the, the Razor session here was fantastic. It was very clear, it's building products, it's by gamers, it's for gamers, and they look at cost second. They first look at what is true, what is the best product for the gamer. I think that, that, that's the best advice you can, you can, you can give. Casper? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, it brings it in another interesting element to this conversation, because I mean, we've been sort of talking a bit about sort of, um, collaboration between agencies. Um, you know, and certainly um, there's, there's an aspect of that. But I think the other really interesting territory is the collaboration with a lot of the companies out there in FOIA today. You know, and, um, uh, you know certainly one of the um, one of the uh, realities of working with a bigger agency like ours. And, you know, interesting, Jim, how you guys deal with this you know, in a smaller agency? But you know, we, we don't. You know, we, we are focused on scale. I mean, we have amazing scale to deliver to execute and that kind of thing. But you know, actually, it, it, it actually is much more efficient, effective, and also, frankly, exciting for our own people to partner with some of the guys out there on virtual reality projects or augmented reality or, you know, on, on some, you know, crazy user-generated idea or whatever, whatever it might be, you know. Um, uh, so I think there's a very, you know, I think there's a, 
we're seeing that with agencies being here at the event. We're seeing, you know, I know at, at Spikes this year, they're, they're thinking of bringing a lot of more startups into that event as well. And, you know, I think there's 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 a really interesting um, uh, there's, there's a really interesting and vibrant ecosystem now where people are recognizing that some of the best ideas are coming from outside the larger organizations. You know, I know we were meant to have about um, from Unilever on stage, but what they're doing is fascinating and supporting um, uh, startups in all sorts of different parts of the world, you know, the world in sorts of you know, not just in FMCG, but in all sorts of great ideas. Um, uh, and I think that's a really interesting, fertile territory, you know, and I think we have to think very differently about the organizations we're working. You know, I, I can't think of Wonderment just as being the four walls of Eastern, you know, because if I think that, then we will definitely fail. You know, we have to think about it as all the different points of connection that we have within the WPP group, that we have within Singapore, that we have within Asia, that we have within, between our brands, the partners that our brands have relationships with. You know, it's all about bringing all of that together in a way that, you know, is democratic and, and makes sure that the, the, the best idea has a chance to shine. Well, that's very interesting because, like Jim said, if you're in a giant agency and if, and if it's a ship and it's turning too slowly, maybe you'll hit an iceberg. So, um, we only have a couple minutes left, so I want to ask for your predictions. Casper um, uh, mentioned about how some of the smaller outfits outside are experimenting with virtual reality, which um, is another exciting forefront in terms of the marketing world. What are, each of you give a prediction of what we're going to see in terms of in industry changes? Um, okay, if you look at the um, economy on a whole, um, whether it's here or um, especially um, uh, so much so in Southeast Asia. Um, there are emerging economies, um, and uh, those are the economies that will require a certain level of services which we are able to provide. Um, and again, back to the big data for now, uh, those are the markets that don't really have those data, so what do you do? You basically have to rely on the, the past yesteryear's way of doing things, but in a more contemporary manner. Um, for markets that are developing in, in uh, this part of the world, um, obviously cost efficiency is definitely going to be number one. Two, lead generation is going to be very critical. So I've been to many meetings and clients saying, well, okay, um, away with those uh, fancy ideas, give me solutions that I don't have to spend so much, but I can move my products. So when I move my products, you basically can get uh, uh, more money out. So it, it has happened uh, years ago where Skin in a Game is part of it, and I think Skin in a Game will be coming more and more prominent uh, as part of the key performance uh, uh, measures for agencies. Key? So I, I think about this question um, from, a, from a consumer angle. I actually think about my children who are 12 and 10. And I think about what their lifespan is going to be like. The one thing we know, and this is not a prediction, this is just fact, the rate of change is increasing all the time, e exponentially increasing when you look at changing technology. Um, frankly, it concerns me. Like, if you think about what that rate of power does around the, the, you know, phishing and scams, what is, what is AI going to mean to the, to the job market? What does virtual reality mean to real reality and interaction with other humans? And so I've talked a bit today about accountability, um, about standards, if you like, about regulatory structures. How do regulations keep up with the kind of changes that we're all building? So I'm an entrepreneur. I love innovation. I love building stuff. But I increasingly feel concerned that are we are we thinking about the impact of what, what's going to happen? So I hope we, we all continue to think responsibly about, about the long term around these you know, great technology we're building, great power. Um, but with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know we've got 10 seconds, so maybe just like, I mean, I think another element of that, again, with AI and machine learning, which I think is going to be equally as disruptive, so it's also what that means for brands, which I think is very interesting, because we already see with voice search, Brands are becoming, it's much more difficult to see the role for a brand there. Like, how do you search for a brand when you're talking to Alexa? When you say, buy tickets to whatever, buy, buy lipstick or whatever, right? 
Um, you know, and then the next, of course, version of that is also the Internet of Things, where machines start making the decisions for us. You know, your washing machine knows which powder is, washes the whitest, causes the least amount of wear and tear, uses the least amount of energy, just places the order for you, and just removes you completely from the decision-making process. You know, I mean, we're already partly there with voice search, and you know, that's definitely where it's going. So that creates a fundamentally different marketing ecosystem. Out. Well, there we go. So AI, virtual reality, uh, voice search, and as we always deal with, uh, doing more for less money, that is. Thank you so much. Keith, Jim, and Casper, let's give them a round of applause for their insights. Thank you. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for that.